You may be seated. And I want to say, did we want to sing that first hymn or what? <laughs> Your intro was great. We just kept stepping on it. But we, we got there. So bravo to us all. I want to begin uh, this sermon with a statement of fact. I was nuts for singer and songwriter Tracy Chapman before it was cool. <laughs> so, for those of you who wonder about the relevance of that statement, there was a larger than life power that unfolded on stage during the Grammy Awards last Sunday. How many of you watched the Grammys? Oh my. So Tracy Chapman is an amazing woman. She is a black songwriter who wrote a song called Fast Car in 1988. Now, if you're like me, I tell time by the birth of my children. So my middle child, when Tracy Chapman wrote that song, was one years old, and today she's 37. So Tracy Chapman was raised Baptist. And she went to school at Tufts University, and through her art and her being, she has supported many social justice causes like Amnesty International, feminism, activism around AIDS, and raising awareness around human rights violations. She doesn't speak much about her private life, but author Alice Walker has said that publicly that she and Chapman were in a relationship for some time. Tracy Chapman's songs sing with faith. Her song, Talking About a Revolution, is one of the best voicings of the Magnificat I have ever heard. That is Mary's song of yes, talking about how it is the powerful and the, and the disempowered will switch places in God's vision of the world. So what is it about Tracy Chapman that has anything to do with today's scripture, you may ask? And what happened to the three disciples up on a mountaintop in the company of Jesus? I want to set the stage for Mark's gospel. Today's reading is a hinge text shared during a hinge Sunday. I mentioned that this Sunday is the last Sunday of the season of Epiphany, and this Wednesday on Ash Wednesday, we enter into the season of Lent. And most poignantly, the text that I will read shortly for you is a hinge in the story of Jesus because we move with Jesus from a story about possibility and wild hope and miracles done in the midst of community. We move in this time of the Gospel of Mark into the realization that Jesus is moving toward the cross. He has begun to tell his disciples that he will not always be with them. He shares with them that his way of life, the way that he is trying to live in their midst, is going to ask more of them than they can imagine. And maybe more of them than they may have the courage to live. He tells them right before today's scripture passage that suffering is real and it will be real. So living and learning by his side, the disciples hear the messages that thrill them about healing and they see the miracles occurring before their eyes and they hear the message too about suffering and the surrender of any sense of surety. And it's a message they don't much want to hear. They follow Jesus with hearts that are hopeful and heavy. So in today's text, Jesus goes up on a mountaintop and he takes with him his beloved disciples and here is what happens. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and, sent the, and led them up onto a high mountain. And before them, his appearance changed 
from the inside out, right before their eyes. His clothes shimmered, glistening white, whiter than any bleach could make them. Elijah, along with Moses, came into view, and they were in deep conversation with Jesus. And Peter interrupted, Rabbi, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he blurted this out without thinking because stunned they were all by what they were seeing. And then a light radiant cloud enveloped them. And from deep in the cloud came a voice, this is my son, marked by my love. Listen to him. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. So, The disciples experience seeing their beloved teacher transfigured before their eyes and God bless those disciples then and always. They take the dazzle of that miracle and it's too much to take in and they do what we are wont to do. We who are human beings, they want to memorialize. They want to freeze the miracle and hold the miracle static for all time. And the way they decide to do that is to build memorials that will somehow contain miracles. One to memorialize the prophet Elijah. One to memorialize Moses, who is a leader of the terrified and hopeful. And one to memorialize Jesus the Christ. The disciples were drenched in grace and in the dazzle of miracle. And their first instinct was to figure out how to freeze it and keep it. Kind of like the so many of us who are in the midst of miracle and we whip out our cell phones. Can I hear an amen? Because we're so intent on capturing miracle that we don't let ourselves be fully present to it. So we get how the disciples are moved to move, right? God gets it too. Thank you, God, because God speaks into the midst of that mountaintop miracle by saying words very similar to the ones that were heard when Jesus was baptized and when Stephen was baptized. This is my son, marked by my love. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Don't keep his teachings and his healings and his power and his dazzle and his light and his suffering and his invitation walled away in some crazy kind of sense you have that you can contain and manipulate miracle. Listen to Jesus. Live into the power of the miracle around you. So back to Tracy Chapman. Tracy Chapman stepped out of public life for a time until a country singer, Luke Combs, you probably already heard this, but I just think it's remarkable. Luke Combs is a straight white man, a country singer who did a representation of Fast Car and it hit the top of the charts. Last weekend, he and Tracy Chapman performed it together on stage. And that performance was beautiful. But more than that, on this day, I want to say that that performance was healing in the way of Jesus. Did you feel it as you observed it and watched it? You can still watch it on YouTube. Here were two people seemingly impossibly different from each other. On stage were two people our culture seems intent upon othering each other out of any kind of relationship, let alone collaboration. And what they did was teach us all. Certainly they taught my heart how tired I am, how tired we are of the way that possibility 
and sacred power has been thought to be the exclusive property of one population of people. Whether they're liberal or conservative, gay or straight, Christian or Muslim, boomers or Gen Z, right? What we saw on stage on Sunday night was a witness for, I believe, what it is Jesus wanted the disciples then and now to know. And that is this. How about we learn to listen to Jesus how about we learn to listen to the Jesus, the sacred power, the irreplaceable power that exists in every human being? How about we learn to come out of the cultural structures we have built that keep us stuck and isolated, structures meant to isolate us and keep us frozen in fear, structures that can put us on a memory loop trying to memorialize a time that may or may not have been great and open ourselves instead to the power of what it is to be human beings, summoning all the courage we have to live in the way of Jesus Christ. Listening to Jesus means that we, each one of us, we experience transformation. We experience times when we can see the sacred so fully that it near stops our breath. And we stay in it. We choose to allow ourselves to be staggered by beauty and miracle. And we don't allow ourselves to be walled away or separated from it. We don't clutch those times with all we have. And we do not make a shrine of the times that we thought we had all the answers. But instead, we do what Jesus did. We come down from the mountain and we get to work healing and blessing and suffering with and working with all that we have in a world in which we listen for the sacred truths in all whom we encounter. Living in the way of Jesus is not meant to be a movement, a monument, a movement dedicated to building memorials. That's what I wanted to say beautiful as they are, we're sitting in one. But this is not a memorial structure. We are a movement dedicated to building hope and joy and justice in the way of Jesus. And some of us come to churches to get fueled for ministry. Some of us come to places that hold and bless us where our children are known by name. And that is stunning good in this world as long as we do not forget what the building is for. Right? As long as we do not forget that this sanctuary is no memorial meant to contain the gospel. Churches are meant to feed and equip us so that we can take the dazzle and the power of Jesus into a sorely conflicted world. Tracy, thank you. <laughs> Tracy Chap, that was an amen. Tracy Chapman and Luke Combs were witnesses last Sunday night. An 80-year-old Jody Mitchell, oh, we are not worthy, singing on stage about disillusionment and beauty and life was a witness at the Grammys on Sunday night. And saxophones are a witness. Can I hear an amen? Yes. So this morning I want to share with you one more musical witness. And I'm trusting that you'll indulge me on this Mardi Gras Sunday because the video is of my, uh, one of my granddaughters whose name is Kit. You may remember Kit from when she was here on my first Sunday and she launched herself into my arms while I was leading worship for the first time in your midst. Kit is two and a half years old and she will someday rule the world. <laughs> As I thought about this sermon and about how it is the disciples learned on that mountain, I mean really learned on that mountain who they were 
and how it was Jesus could not be contained and that he was teacher and worker and, and maker of miracles and that they would follow him all of their lives, I thought about this video that I'm going to have shown to you. It features Kit and her father, who is my son-in-law. And here's what I love about this video and its message for today. Kit knows who I am. People call me by many names, most of them good, like pastor and wife and sister and mom and Elizabeth, all kinds of names I am known by. But Kit, she doesn't care about those other names. What she knows is that I am her grandma. What she knows is I am her grandma. And that's what matters to Kit. All right, Jonathan, we're ready. My mother-in-law. My. Your grandma. My grandma. Is my mother-in-law. Is my grandma. Is my mother-in-law. Is my grandma. She's. Your grandma. She's my grandma. <laughs> so throughout our lives, beloveds, we, like those long ago disciples, we get to encounter Jesus, who is named as teacher and rabbi and rabble rouser and guide and messiah and redeemer and sabbath defiler and all kinds of other names. But really, the song we sing throughout our discipleship comes down to this. Is he our Jesus? Are we listening to Jesus? Are we really listening to the one who wades into life and calls us each to healing and to hope? He is my Jesus, and he is your Jesus, and he is the Jesus who will not be contained or domesticated or memorialized, and we get to summon all of the courage and imagination and hope we can imagine in order to listen and follow Jesus into life. And we want that for ourselves. We want that for this world. And we want that for Stephen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing.